All right. Thank you all for, for joining today's meeting, uh, today's training. Uh, my name is Chris Morgia. I'm a senior analyst in NASA's Office of Procurement Grants Policy and Compliance team. Um, today's training is in regards to the Payment Management Systems Federal Financial Report or FFR module. Uh, today's training will be led by Andre Thomas from the Department of Health and Human Services or HHS. Um, as you all may be aware, uh, in, in the past, NASA has required the submission of quarterly federal cash transaction reports or SCTRs. We have recently uh, revised our policy to require semi-annual federal financial reports to be submitted in the payment management system. The semi-annual reports will be, will be due twice a year with the first FFRs being due uh, no later than April 30th of this year. And those reports should become available in your, your PMS accounts uh, around April 1st. The, the next or the second FFR will be due no later than October 30th of this year. And again, those reports should become available around October 1 of this year. Uh, before I turn it over to Tanja, uh, I just want to let you know I'm going to drop some, some helpful links into the chat where I'm going to put links to NASA's Grants Policy and Compliance's website. I'm going to drop a link to our latest FFR policy, which describes the, the transition that I just outlined. Um, and I'm going to drop a link to NASA's YouTube playlist where we have our previous uh, iteration of our PMS FFR training. Um, just as, as a reminder, this training will be exactly nearly the same as the one we just did on February 22nd. Right? So it's a repeat of that PMS FFR training. We just wanted to offer two sessions for you all. So without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Andre Thomas at HHS. I'm gonna stop sharing this slide. And Tanja, feel free to share your, your deck. All right. Now, can you hear me? Yep, can hear you. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Um, today, we will go over the federal financial report for NASA and other additional information as well. The today's presentation will be provided to NASA and they will, um, forward it to you as well. So today's discussion topics will be, uh, just a short background. Go over goals, assets and PMS, the federal financial report module submission requests. I'm going over some FAQs and there is a general information session. And then I will open it up for any additional questions that you may have. So during the presentation, um, because it is quite lengthy, I'm going to complete the entire presentation. Um, please, any questions you have, please put them in the chat box. I know my counterparts at NASA will help in assisting answering questions and the ones that they're not uh, not able to or need clarifications, I will go over those um, during our last uh, session of the Q, um, Q and A. So, just the background regarding the uh, Federal Financial Report, the Standard Form Four Two Five. Um, you are able to so per NASA, you're submitting them in Payment Management System semi annually. Most of our agencies do quarter. But NASA will be has requested yours to be semi annual, and there are also other annual reports that may be due in multiple systems. So because multiple grantees were having to complete reports in different systems, um, OMB has then um, decided there's just one report, and so PMS is what we call a one stop shop. And this is also based off the executive government wide objectives to reduce recipient burdens. And that is based on the data act section 5 grants pilot. OMB memo section 1824 and the president's management. Agenda. Okay, it, it, I saw you lobbying in. Hey, oh. uh, we have a, it sounds like we got an open mic. If you could all mute your mics, please. Thank you. NASA goal is to consolidate their federal financial reporting for grant recipients through payment management system April 2024. 
So this will help improve consistency with one source reporting, being able to share financial data between multiple grant systems. This will assist NASA with their grant monitoring and closeouts, and it also helps to reduce expired award payments. So here are our current um, NASA centers that we have set up in the payment management system. So when you complete your FFR, it will tell you which center you are completing your FFR for. Your semi-annual report due date. So your first semi-annual FFR will be for the period ending March 31st, which is due on or before April 30th, and it covers your reporting period from October through March. It will be available in PMS. Microphone. The second semi-annual FFR, which is for the period ending September 30th, is due on or before October 30th. And that reporting period covers April through September. That report will be available in PMS on September 1st. So I will reiterate, if you try to go in now, no reports will be available for you under um, NASA at all at this time. They will be available to you starting April the 1st. These are just some of the agencies that are currently utilizing the FFR functionality in the payment management system. How to request access. So a couple of things just to inform you, please ensure that you bookmark our homepage, which is pms.psc.gov. A lot of individuals are bookmarking at the login page. So you are missing important information that we may have on our page that usually is in pink. So in pink, we will provide additional information that we need you to know. Um, also, as you can see here, there's also a little information about NASA and regarding the cash report and the FFR. If you click read more, you will find additional information. Also on this homepage, we under grant recipient, we have a lot of detailed information to assist you with your grant program. If you do not have access to payment management system, then you must use the uh, user access tab to gain access. For new users and or individuals that have been deactivated from payment management system due to 60 days of non-activity, you must submit a new user request. We do not reactivate any user IDs once they have been deactivated. Also under user access, if you leave PMS or someone else leaves PMS, you can deactivate that user if they no longer um, need access. The access request status. Each time you submit an access request or a submission in PMS, you will get a request ID number. You can use that request ID number to check the status of your request. And we also have detailed instructions about access. When accessing payment management system, when you go to new user, or if you've been deactivated and we still consider you a new user, under user type, please ensure you are selecting grant recipient. Enter your email address and confirm your email address. It's important that you remember what email you are using um, when you are doing um, access because PMS now requires ID me. They both have to match. So please ensure that um, what email um, you are using in payment management system. Once you enter your email twice, click on the request verification code button, check your email, and if it's not in your inbox, please check your spam folder to obtain that um, code. Enter the code and set up your security questions and answers and then click the submit button. The first thing you would do is add your um, PMS account number um, to your profile, even if you currently have access to payment management system. 
if you receive another PMS account number, you're still going to follow the same process. Okay, so here you're going to select add. And then on the screen, when it asks for organization name, we need your legal organization name. And that is how you was registered in payment management system. And it matches SAM.gov. It has to be exact. If not, if you submit it, we're going to reject it. You're going to select the, uh, the um, EIN selection. You're going to enter your 12-digit PMS EIN number. And you should have received that EIN number from your grants officer when they provided you the PIN. Select yes, and then click save. Here on the screen, it will show your legal organization name, your 12-digit EIN number, and it lets us know it's an EIN in all accounts. So again, if you you may have uh, grants with multiple NASA centers, every time you get a new PMS account number, you must add it to your profile. Please set up your contact information. Enter the information here. Everything with the asterisk is mandatory. This is the most important piece. You must check as far as access level, what role are you going to be performing? Are you going to be responsible for payment requests? Are you going to do add or update banking? For the federal cash transaction report, you no longer have to submit this. So effective December 2023, NASA no longer completes the quarterly cash transaction report in PMS. You must select or someone from your organization must request access to the federal financial report. Uh, you can uh, request view only, whether you're doing prepare only or certifier only. If you do not select anything, you will not have access to the NASA federal financial report come um, April the 1st. Ensure your supervisor's information has been submitted. Unless you are the highest individual in your organization, please enter your supervisor's information. Ensure that the email is accurate because they will get an email to approve the request. The supervisor does not have to have access to PMS. We send an email and there is a link for them to complete. You do not have to enter comments, read the certification statement, check the box, and click on submit. At this point, you get a request ID number on the screen, and you're going to get an email with that same request ID number. Save that request ID number until your request has been completed. If you're contacting payment management system or the help desk, we're going to ask for the request ID number. So please always provide that information. For new users, you can check the status of your request by going back under user access, entering that request ID number, provide your security question and answer, and hit submit. Then you're going to see the screen, and it says request status. It lets us know it's already been approved by the supervisor, or if it haven't been approved by the supervisor, it will let you know. And it says assigned to PMS. So if your supervisor hasn't approved it, it's going to say assigned to your supervisor. Once it's in PMS, then staff will um, review your submission and process. It is a two-level process. So a lot of times people think, Oh, my supervisor approval, I don't have access. That's not how it works. Your supervisor does the first level, then um, it has a two-step level in payment management system. Once this two-step level has been completed, that's when you re receive your PMS user ID. If you already have access to payment management system, 
all you need to do, especially to update your profile for your to get access to the FSR, is to go to um, PMS on the dashboard to the top left, click, click on menu, select user accounts maintenance, update privileges, and then you, either you can add your new a uh, PMS pin or EIN number, or you can go and select your FFR preference, whether you do a view only, prepare only, or you are a certifier. So let's go into the federal financial report module. One of the things I do want you to just um, be aware of, we recommend that you use Microsoft Edge with the federal financial report. Uh, we have found out sometimes Chrome don't work as good as Edge as far as some of the functionality. And it has to do with the web of uh, the internet browser itself. For the federal financial report, you will be able to ask your FFRs as long as you request the access to the module. You will be able to view, prepare, revise um, your reports. Um, again, you only we only assign one PMS user ID. So each time you have a new PMS account number, you can um, add it to your existing profile. You do not need separate PMS user IDs when it comes to payment management system. That's why we state you can combine your authorities on the same account. You will also be able to view any submission histories for that submitted report. And you will also be able to upload any supporting documentation as well. Payment management staff will be available to assist you if you need a system with the access portion, also with navigating the FFR. But as I go through the FFR, I will inform you what staff will be able to assist you with or not assist you with. Again, they are there to provide technical support and training as well. So with today for NASA, they have asked me to do training on uh, for the entire NASA grant community. And so that's why we're here today. I'm just gonna show you a high level or how the FFR works before I go into the actual screen. So on um, once you start the actual FFR, there are some fields that are gonna be pre-populated and some fields that are not gonna be pre-populated. Some of these fields you will be able to edit and some you would not be able to edit. So this is just a how overview of how the form, what fields you will be able to complete. So when we talk about section 10, which is your cash receipts section, A, B, and C. So A will be a pre-populated field. You will not be able to edit that field. We are pulling your payments directly from payment management system through the end of that reporting period. 10B cash disbursement is an editable field. So you'll be able to report your actual disbursements for that specific grant. 10C will be auto calculated. Going down to the next section where it's federal expenditures and unobligated balance. If it's that uh, authorized amount, we're gonna pre-populate it and it's not editable. It's pulling directly from the authorization that NASA has authorized in the system for your specific grant. The next two fields, E and F, are editable fields and you will enter the data. G and H are auto-calculated based off of the data you enter. The remainder of the reports will be open fields for you to enter data if you are required to report recipient share and if you're required to report program income. When it comes to like line K and line O, those are calculated fields and the system will auto populate those calculations for you. So now we're gonna get into the actual reporting. How do you get to these fin federal financial reports? Some of you may already use the FFR for other agency um, some of you would, this would be the first time you're utilizing um, the PMS FFR module. When you log into payment management system, the first thing you're gonna do is the top left, click on menu. 
and then click on federal financial reporting. Once there, you can click on federal financial report. We do have a user guide there as well that's available for you. Also, you can get to the federal financial report from your dashboard, directly on your dashboard. So on your dashboard, it would tell you um, when your reports are available and also if you have any delinquent reports. So on that dashboard to the right side under action, if you click on it, it will take you directly to the delinquent reports or directly to your reports that be able to certify. Um, again, that's your second option. Your first option is just to use the menu nodes. And then your second option is to access the FFR directly from the dashboard. So this is the report search screen. You were able to search your FFR by your PMS account number, the federal grant ID number, which is the PMS grant document number, you can do reporting periods, all or current period. You can search by delinquent reports. Also, you can search by statuses. So throughout the rest of the presentation, I will be talking about report statuses. So you have several types of report statuses. One would be the report, the report is available for you to be completed. The next status report has been paired by grantee. That means you started the report and saved it and you're gonna go back later to submit it. Another status is report certified pending agency approval. That means you submitted the report and it's been routed to NASA for review and approval or rejection. The next one may be awarding agency approval. That means they have reviewed it and approved it. And then the other report status you may have is re, uh, awarding agency rejection. That means your uh, that um, NASA has reviewed it and something needs to be changed and they will enter comments. So a comments is mandatory for rejections. So they will enter the comments, let you know why they rejected that FFR. That And then if your FFR is reject, rejections, you will be able to edit it and then resubmit. So once you do your criteria or selections, then you click search. So one other thing to note, if you do not enter any data or you do not um, change any of the drop down menus at all, if you just click search, then all the FFRs you have access to will automatically generate if you do not put anything or you do not change any of the actual drop down. So once you finish your, your criteria, click on the search button. And then here is just a sample you will see. You'll see your PMS account number, the federal grant ID number. It will let you know the agency and the report type. You will also see the reporting period ending date and the due date. The report submission date will populate once you have prepared, certified, and submitted the report. If the, once the report is available to be completed, that is what the report status will state. It will let you know your form type, which is your SF-425, and then delinquent. If you are delinquent, so we know reports for your first quarter in the March are due on or before April the 30th. Once your report is delinquent, it will highlight in pink as shown here. And also under delinquent column, it will have the little um, circle with the exclamation in red to let you know it's delinquent. Once your report has been submitted, the delinquent notice automatically removed. Under actions, you have the first action is your little icon that looks like a little notepad with the pencil. That's how you will access the FFR. Your second icon is the print function. So some individuals will print their FFR before they submit data and then after they submit data. Once 
once you select the little notepad icon, it will take you to your screen. So you will have several tabs here as shown. So you start with the report, uh, the prepare report tab. Here it will tell you which NASA center you are completing the FFR for. Then it will have your grant number. Section three, four, and five will populate your organization's information. And box five will be an editable field. Most cases, it pre-populates your PMS account number. However, that field is for your use only. Some individuals will change the account number and you may have your own internal name for the grants and you can enter it there. If section three, four, and five, I mean, section three and four needs to be updated, please contact your awarding agency. We're pulling that data directly from PMS. Um, I will mention this again later, but if your address or you say, no, the address not right, or no, my name is not, uh, the organization name has changed, you must ensure that the information has been updated in SAM.gov first. Then notify your contact at NASA, and then NASA will submit a request in PMS to update the data. And then once we review it and um, process it, then the data gets updated that way. So you would not be able to change any uh, data on lines three and four at all, okay? Because those are pulling directly from payment management systems information. The next section of your FFR, it'll tell you your report type. So your report type will say semi-annual. Also, we'll have your basis of accounting, um, whether you're doing accrual or cash, and you just make your selection from the drop-down menu. Your project period is uh, pre-populated based off of the award information we have in payment management system. And then number nine, your reporting period end date is also pre-populated. That would be for your reporting period. The next section is your cash section. So 10A cash receipts will auto-populate and it is a non-editable field. So it will pull all your payments or your financial transaction through the end of that reporting period. So since your first semi-annual is through March 31st, it will pull it all the way through March 31st. 10B is an editable field. You will enter your actual disbursements on that line. 10C will auto-calculate depending on what you enter. So it will let us know whether you are doing dollar for dollar are a reimbursable payment, which means your cash on hand will be show as a negative, or you have an or you had an advance, and that online ten C will be a positive number. When it comes to finals, if you when it's time for your final submission, your ten A, ten B, and what you're going to enter on your expenditures, which is ten E will all have to match before you are able to submit your FFR. If those do not match, we do have validations in the system. So as you see here, it's nice and then pink to let you know these three do not match. So something has to change. So either because you're reporting um, expenditures less than um, what you received, then either you need to return funds back to payment management system or you need to request um, or you need to adjust 10 E. So only for your final will you get that message, a validation message, and it has to be rectified before you're able to submit your report. 10 D is authorized amount, which pulls from your actual authorizations in the payment management system. 10E, you will enter your federal expenditures. 10F, you will enter your unliquidated obligations. G and H will auto-calculate. 
based off the data you enter in D and, and I'm sorry, in E and F and based off the calculations as well for D. The next section is recipient share. If you are required to report recipient share and it's based off of your notice of award or your terms and conditions, then please enter your recipient share in that uh, in line I. If NASA has informed us that you have a matching or something of that nature, then we will um, provide that information in I. J, you will complete as well. If you're not required to report recipient share, then please enter zeros. Line K is auto calculated field based off the data you enter on line I and J. The same for program income. You will report reports program income if you are required and was stated in your notice of grant award or terms and conditions. If you're not required to report program income, then enter zeros. You will complete the data for L, M, and N, and the system will automatically calculate line O. For indirect expense. You will enter the data for indirect expense if you're required to report. Um, PMS only allows up to two um, indirect expense rates. If you have more than two, then you are able to upload documentation or, or you can also enter data in the comment box as well. One of the things I do want you to note when you're doing your rates, please be mindful of how you're doing the percentage sign. Because if it's not accurate, it would give you a bigger uh, base or federal share rate than you um, anticipated. So please be mindful of how you are entering the rate or using your decimal point when you're um, entering the rate information. Also, for your indirect expense rate, um, if it does not populate correctly, um, maybe it depends on um, the percentage or the rate itself, you can remove the rate and answer the base amount yourself without doing the calculation. And then all you need to do is enter comments in box 12. So box 12 is your remarks box. So for any of your line items you want to provide NASA with some additional clarifications, um, you can enter it in box number 12. The character limit, I believe it's uh, 4,000 character limits on the remarks box. Once the top of your FFR has been completed, as a preparer, you have a couple of options. So the first option, you can save it and then come back later to submit your report. Or if you both the prepare and the certifier, then you can submit the report. So I'm gonna be prepare and the certifier. So at the top under prepare, I'm from the drop down menu, I am going to select my name. The system will automatically pre-populate the remainder of the information based on your profile. Once you do that, you wanna click submit. Then as a certifier, if you're doing certifier roles, then on line 10B from the drop down menu, you're gonna um, select your name. Everything else will be pre-populated. At this point, if you are the certifier and you feel that something or what something needs to be changed, you can select the edit report button and then make that change. And it has to go back through the prepare to um, to uh, prepare it, they have to submit it, and then it comes back to the certifier. So as a certifier, if everything looks fine on the report, you're gonna click the certify button. And then here, you're gonna get a message certified transaction complete. I'm missing my code. 
at this point, your report has been submitted. So the status will then change from report to be available completed to report certified pending agency approval. And also if your report was delinquent, it would then now go off delinquency. So at this point, it has been routed to NASA for review and approval. If for any reason you need to edit your report, you can edit the report with the report status being report certified pending agency approval. Once you click back on the little notepad icon at the top and bottom of your page, you're going to see the words edit report. If you click on those words, it will reopen the report to all the fields that you are able to edit. And then you will make your um, updates and then just go back through the certification process. The preparer has to prepare it and then certify it. And then the certifier would do their certification and submit. You are able to also use our upload features. When we talk about upload, you have to use the um, actual template that we have available under the FFR module. You can find that under group actions. That's on top of the screen. And then you're going to go and select download because the download has to be in a CS, uh, CSV file and the template is already set up for you. You cannot upload a PDF and you cannot upload your own version of the FFR. You have to use the template we have in the system. Once you download it, you're gonna fill in the information that's gonna be on that, access, on that CSV file. You're gonna enter it and then you're gonna use the upload function to upload that report. So here it'll tell you your upload, you'll use option A, go find your file, name it, select the file type, which is going to be CSV, and then hit the upload feature. The upload feature has quite a bit of detailed information. I will be providing NASA with their um, instructions for uploading. One of the things I do want you to know, when you use the upload feature, you still have to go into the FFR and certify it. There is no bulk certification for the upload. So you still have to certify the report as a preparer and certify the report as the certifier. The next section is submission requests, access and banking. So effective February the 10th, PMS requires um everyone to have an IDME account. Payment management system is a high FISMA system. So we had to put updated security measures in our system. So you must have an IDME account before you are able to log into PMS. If you have not set up your IDME account, please do so as soon as possible. If you already have an IDME account, please ensure that the email address on your IDME account is the, is the same as your primary email you used um, to request access to PMS. If it's not, go into your profile under IDME and set that email as your primary email to log into payment management system. If you have issues with ID me only, please reach out to the XMS help desk. And that's the XMS help at hhs.gov. Do not contact PMS help desk. Help desk, okay? ID me is not a PMS um, program. We're using ID me. So you need to contact ID me if you're having issues only with ID me. If it's other issues, then you're going to contact the PMS help desk. So we have been getting this and, and per um, request from um, my NASA contacts, asked me to go over a couple of things when it comes to submission. 
So we are experiencing a delay with processing new user requests and banking due to the new controls that we had to put in place to validate the authenticity of all our users. So that's why I say it's extremely important that you have your IDME account established. We are receiving weekly lists of users that have an IDME account. And if you have an IDME account, then we don't have to take the next steps to validate your um, saying that you are who you are. So what our process is now, and we're gonna be changing it again soon. So for now, our process is for all our banking and new users. If you do not have an IDB account established, we are required to contact the individual listed in SAM.gov. So we need you to ensure that the contact person under your organization name for SAM.gov is updated as well as their telephone number. We, If we uh, contact that individual, we allow up to five business days for them to respond back to our request. If not, your request is going to be rejected and you got to start the process again. And that means it may go to the, it goes to the back of the line. We are processing requests in the order in which they are received. I mentioned earlier about the request ID number. It is important if you're contacting your liaison accountants or the PMS help desk, not XMS the PMS help desk regarding your access submission or banking submission, please provide us with the request ID number. It begins with the EST if you're a new user, um, UPD if it's an update, and then BANK if you're doing banking. Requests are, are being processed in the order of receipt. It may take up to 25 business days. It may not. It all depends. Staff has been working after hours and on the weekends to clear the backlog. I can't tell you. Um, I had did assist an individual on Tuesday. Their IDME account was already set up. On Wednesday, that new user has their access. So that's why it's important that you have your IDME account already set up. So we apologize for any delays that you may be experiencing with access and banking updates. So we are working diligently to complete the uh, our backlog in the payment management system and working with our upper management as well. So that's why I said, again, I can't reiterate about the request ID number that comes on your screen. And please save this request ID number until your request has been completed. Also, when it comes to your direct deposit sign up form. So some of these questions came up in the last session. So I added them for this session um, to be clear because a lot of individuals have asked about their banking. So it is important you one type of form of banking. And that is the SF1199A. You can obtain it from our webpage. You can obtain it from Treasury webpage. Any other forms, we will not accept it. We are going to reject your request. We need a clean copy. So no erasers, no whiteouts, no lineouts, anything that looks like is going to be altered, we can see it coming through the system. So we need a clean copy when you're doing your banking. You only need one copy. So it is a three carbon. You only need to complete one of them, um, only the, the first one. You do not need to submit your notice of grant award. We don't even look at it. You do not need to submit a cancel check or um, a deposit slip. We don't review them. The only thing we're going to look at is that direct deposit sign up form to ensure it is in order. So I'm going to go a couple of things why are your bankings are being rejected. One, Section 1A. The name that's on Section 1A 
must be the legal organization name that matches payment management system. It has to match to a T or we're going to reject it. Section 1B, it has to be the name of the organization. Unless the grant was issued to an individual, the person is not entitled to your grant payment. The grant was issued to an organization. So it needs to be the name of the organization. Section C is either going to be your, your tax ID number or the PMS 12-digit EIN. D, ensure you have that checked. E, provide the account number. When it comes to section F, you can select other, you can either put grant or NASA. G, you can leave it blank. F, I'm sorry, not F. <laughs> At the bottom for signatures, ensure that um, it is signed by your financial rep or whoever has authority to sign your financial documents. When it comes to signature, it needs to be original or e-signature, what we call electronic signature. If it looks like it was, um, you know, we have a font, you typed it and then you use the font signature um, from the drop down menu for font types. If it looks like it's not real or it wasn't a, a, a e-signature, staff will reject it, okay? The next section, section two. If you're using the form from payment management system, we're automatically populating our address. If you're getting it from Treasury, the section two will probably blank, then you can use NASA information. So sometimes I know before NASA used to have their information pre-populated for NASA shared services, but section two has to be completed. It's either gonna be payment management system or NASA, not your information. Section three must be completed by the bank in its entirety. We are rejecting a lot of banking because the depositor account title is not accurate. Some people are putting checking. That is not the title on your account. We need the actual title on your account. Please ensure your bank has signed it as well, original or e-signature. Also, when it comes to banking, no, we do not um, pull banking from SAM.gov. We're not affiliated with SAM.gov. We don't pull data from SAM.gov when it comes to banking. Um, two, please ensure you review the form before you upload it to payment management system. On your dashboard, I talked about this a little earlier. Once you get access to PMS, you can see a lot of your requests on the dashboard. Whether your payment request is on your dashboard, your submission of either updates or on your dashboards of banking, you can see the status directly on your dashboard. And on the action to the right, if you click on actions, it will give you additional information regarding your request. Also, please note, not only are we putting information on the web page, but also we do systems alerts directly on the dashboard. So please review your dashboard for system alerts. When you receive your PowerPoint um, material, we do have some reports and manuals that are available for you. Um, I'm providing the links, but they're also available directly in payment management system if you have those actual modules. Four points of contact, the help desk. Again, if you have general questions or uh, regarding um, your PMS account, please, you can contact the help desk. Um, you can email the help desk, or we have a, also an online um, self-help as well, and you can submit a ticket as well. You can also uh, inquiries for section one through nine, as I stated before, one through nine, we are not able to change in the payment management system. That is being done directly from the information in the payment management system, okay? So if you, if your, 
organization name needs to be changed or the uh, address. Again, I stated to reach out to your grants officer there. Also, to let you note, um, if you're missing a report, you will contact NASA and then they will contact PMS if they need our assistance. When it comes to 10 A, B, and D, because that's pulling from payment management system, well, really A and D are pulling from, pay, pulling from payment management system, please reach out to your PMS liaison accountant or the help desk for issues, and we can um, assist you with rectifying that issue. Also, when you're contacting us, Please have your PMS account number of, um, ready and whichever grant you need assistance for. If you do not know your PMS liaison accountant, on the homepage at the very top, the very last tab under support, it says find your liaison accountant. Under non HHS, if you scroll down to NASA, it will click on it. You can click on your centers, it will tell you who your PMS liaison accountant is. So this section, I'm gonna go over a couple of FAQs based off of our last session that we received. So I received a nice little list. So I'm gonna go over these real quick. I'm hoping that all of these will also help you as well. So the first question that was asked, can we have more time after login to complete tasks before your login expires. So unfortunately, we are not able to change that time. Internally, we wish we can change it as well. We do not control this actual requirement. Financial systems and um, for HHS, our department, we follow all the requirements that are stated by the OCII office. So we do know even for us, it's 15 minutes after non-activity, we also got to go back and log in after it expires. What do you do if you don't see your report available to file? A couple of things. One, check your grantee inquiry authorization screen. When was your grant posted? If it wasn't, it was posted before the um, your um, um, reporting period, then it should be available. If it's at the reporting period, it all depends on when it was posted. That means if it's reported, if your grant authorization was authorized after the end of the reporting period, then that means it's going to be the next quarters before that FFR is generated. Also, check your access. A lot of times when we get these calls, they say, well, the report's not there. The first thing I do is, can I see your profile? They don't have access to the FFR. So make sure you request access to the FFR module. If you've done both of those and you still don't see your report, reach out to your grants officer, inform them that you have a missing report. They will um, contact PMS and we will work together to get that rectified. How are we reporting data on our semi-annual reports? You are going to report cumulative amounts, okay? not monthly, not quarterly, cumulative amounts when you're entering your data on your semi and your reports. Is there someone directly at PMS that they submit the entity update request to? No, there is not. Payment management staff cannot update any of your information in PMS. So as I stated, if you have a name change, address change, UEI change, tax ID change. The first thing you need to do, make sure SAM.gov is updated. Then contact the awarding agency, whoever your contact person is at NASA, inform them of that change. Then the awarding agency will enter the change in payment management system. And then once it's routed to PMS, we will review it and release it. That is how your information get updated in payment management system. Do final 425s need to be emailed to the closeout email address and PMS or just PMS now? So NASA will have to provide you information regarding closeout reports. However, no reports are submitted to PMS via email. 
all reports are submitted directly in the FFR modules. Where will we be able to find a performance report? So you will not find performance reports in payment management system. So please reach out to your grants officer at NASA. The only reports you will find in payment management system is your FFR 425. Is this template specific to the user or a general template? So your the FFR template is specific to the organization when it comes to the data. So all the data pertains to that, um, that individual organization. However, the general template is the same for everyone. Since we change from quality to semi-annual, what months will your reports be due? So I talked about this earlier. To reiterate, your first report, semi-annual reports are for the quarter ending March, are due on or before April 30th. So I'm going to say this now. So April 30th is this year is on a Tuesday. Payment management system is up on the week weekdays from 5 to 11 p.m. So if your report is not in by 11 p.m. on the 30th, at 11.01, the system will place your FFR on delinquency. If your report happens to fall, your due date happens to fall on the weekend, payment management system hours on the weekend is 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. If your report is not submitted on or before that 9 p.m. closing of our system at 9.01, the report will be marked as delinquent. Your second annual semi-annual report is for the period ending September the 30th and is due on or before October 30th. And again, those reports will be available in PMS on September the 1st. So if you try to go in now, no reports available for NASA now, not until April the 1st, okay? I've been trying to get access to PMS for several weeks and keep running into problems. Is there a staff person who can help troubleshoot? You must call, you can contact the PMS help desk. You can also contact your liaison accountant directly. And again, if you do not know who that individual is on that tab, the support tab, um, you can find your actual liaison accountant. I am going to reiterate again. If you have issues with ID me, do not contact PMS support. Contact XMS Help Desk. If you're having issues with a PMS account, then yes, you contact the PMS support or your PMS liaison accountant. I tried, but I cannot log in with my previous login. I requested access, received approval by my supervisor, and I still can't log in. So uh, I'm going to say this again, after 60 days of non-activity, PMS will deactivate your PMS user ID. Once it's deactivated, we cannot reactivate it. You have to submit a new user request. Okay? A lot of times I informed um, on my training sessions, if you only go in once a quarter or not often, make a note on your calendar when you're um, password is going to expire. And that way you won't either get locked out or deactivated altogether. Is there a limit on how many individuals can have access from your organization? No, there is not. Um, you can have as many individuals as you want. That depends on your organization. And there are different roles as well. So you can have four individuals that have access. One person may just be viewing only in PMS. Somebody may just be doing reports. Someone may be doing payments. Another person may be doing everything, but it's up to your internal um, organization how many individuals can have access and what access they should have. We had another question, what is a pen versus a pan? So PIN, which is PIN number, is five digits, which is our pay identification number. 
it normally began with the F, like F1234, or maybe you've been with us uh, for a while. It may be A1234 or B1234. Um, if you've been with us for a long time, it may be four digits instead of five. When we talk about the PAN, which is a payee account number, it's usually seven digits. It ends with a B1 or P1. If you've been with us for a long time, it's usually four digits and it ends with a P or a B, okay? So that is the difference between a pen and a pan. One of the things to note, um, some people say, well, how would I know which one to use? It's all based on how um, NASA has established their centers in our system, the requirements we receive. So once you're in payment management system, um, it will let you know which PMS account is you have um, that has your actual grant authorization posted to. I have not received my request. Who should con who should I contact? Before you contact the PMS liaison staff, please check your dashboard or use the request ID number. So, especially for your payments, your payments always show on your dashboard also you can go to apex grantee inquiry and financial transaction as i um, show on the screen here you can go look at your pms account number to see your payments also if it's rejected it will let you know your payment was rejected as well for grants either expired or restriction is the same thing our method is if we have a required, um, an expired grant, or you're requesting funds from a restricted grant, then it get routed to our whole file. Payment management system staff is required to reach out to the awarding agency and ask for approval. Once we receive the approval, then your request will be re um, released. If we do not receive an approval within a lot of time, normally within three to five business days, then the payment will be rejected and you will be notified. Staff is required to notify you if a payment has been rejected. And again, if you go to the APAX report, grantee inquiry, and select financial transactions inquiry, put in your account number, and run the inquiry, you will see all your financial information there. Um, we changed the name from payments to financial because that would include if you returned funds and also if you um, requested an adjustment from a previous payment request. So those are all my uh, FAQs I have. I'm going to thank you for taking time. I know that was a lot of detailed information, and I hope you will find it very useful as you um, continue to use payment management system and you do your grants. So at this time, uh, Crystal, Corey, I'll turn it back over to you for any additional questions or clarifications you may have. Thank you, Tanya. That was a great training. We appreciate it. Uh, just have a few questions that came up in the chat that we didn't address in the chat. The cell phone that I wanted to run by you, um, and I'll go kind of in order uh, in which they came. Uh, I think you might have addressed this first one, but the question is, uh, will we have access to be a certifier if we already have this access for another agency's FFRs? Yes, you should. Uh, yeah, so come um, April the 1st, if you already have access to your um, other agency FFR module, you should see NASA under your drop down menu for the FFF module, and it should be the exact same. Okay. Uh, second question. Um, I heard it, the question is I heard that ID.me requires us to provide social security numbers. Is that true? And if so, why? Yes, that is required. Um, PMS does not make those rules. That is the rules under IDME. I can tell you um, just from my personal use, uh, being a graduate student, that we are required to have an IDME account. And we had to, and me, I had to upload my social security number and my federal um, ID as well. So that's not nothing PMS has put in place. That is a requirement for IDME. So again, because payment management system is a high FISMA system, 
then we are required to do a multi-authentication. So it's requiring you now to say, this person is who they say they are. And because of fraudulent activities that we have had, we are taking extra precaution of who are getting access to the paper management system. And that is the reason why we have IDME and IDME requires that data. Great, and since we're on the topic of ID.me, um, what else is required to get that account with ID.me? Do you know? Um, I think it's the social security number and also some type of government form ID. Okay. Yes. And that should that, that's probably all clearly laid out on the ID.me website. Correct. Yes. Yes. All right. Um, so there were two questions. I think this might be for better for NASA. Two questions related to uploading PDFs into. PMS, I think that's what the questions we're getting at. So, so basically, NASA's requirement is that the the SF four two fives be entered directly into the SF four two five module within PDF. You don't have to submit uh, a separate PDF uh, into the system. You don't have to submit a separate PDF to NASA. Right, just enter your your FFR information directly into the PMS FFR module. Um. Last question is, uh, can the preparer, can a preparer also certify the report? Yes, unless NASA has restrictions on it, your preparer and certifier can be the same individual. And again, uh, unless your organization uh, has required um, separation of duties, but you can be both okay. the preparer and the certifier. Okay. And then there's a question about uh, section 11, the indirect cost information. Uh, Someone was asking, how do we know if we are required to su submit that information in PMS. So NASA has asked uh, PMS to to require indirect cost information to be submitted on the semiannual reports. Um, so I think I and Tanja, correct me if I'm wrong, but if if somebody leaves that indirect cost information blank, they'll get an error message when they try to submit. Yeah, so I believe we have it based off your requirements. It will have a validation message that this line must be completed. Okay. Um, and we just got another one regarding ID.me. Uh, does the email address we use for PMS need to be the primary email we have listed in ID.me, or does it just yes. need to be one of the listed emails? No, in ID. it needs to be the primary on your ID.me, yes. So if it's not your primary, please go into your ID.me account and make that your primary email, or you will not be able to log into PMS. Okay, okay. And... Going going back to the indirect cost upload, so so I know that you know, we we understand that you upload or providing the indirect cost information for many awards can can potentially be burdensome to, to some of our, our grant recipients. Uh, Tanja, can you go over kind of the bulk upload process again? Um, so I think that yeah. might help with some of that burden, alleviate some of that burden. <laughs> yes, and it's kind of hard to do it in the actual PowerPoint. Um, but I actually have the actual instructions. Um, let's see. I don't, let me see if I could pull them up. Give me a second. And I will send this. Oh, it's on the wrong screen. <laughs> let me see if this is it. Oh, let me find it. Give me one second. I was just looking at it. So give me a second. Uh, here it is. And I will get this out to you um, as well. Oh, okay. It is a PDF file. No wonder it's not coming up. All righty. FFR instructions. Okay. All right. So when I send this to NASA, you will receive this one here. So again, once the first thing you have to do, and I told you about the download. So on the screen itself, can you see the um the actual or is it still showing PowerPoint? I can see uh PDF. Okay, perfect. All right. So when you the first thing you have to do, and I need to stress that on your actual search screen, so on the actual federal FFR search screen, you must use the drop down and download our actual template. Because our template is the 
it looks just like your four to five, but it's going to be in a column in a row. So you need to fill it out that way. And then you're going to save that template. And then you're going to go under under menu under federal financial report. We do have it says upload your FFR. So then you're going to get your file. So you're going to go find your file from wherever it is on your system. Name it, you can whatever you name it, and then the file type is only going to be CSV. And then it's going to, you're going to say upload. Once it's uploaded on the screen, it's going to tell you that your file has been uploaded. And it's going to say whether it's eligible or ineligible. And the reason why, let me see if I can go to another screen. <laughs> okay, let me go back. So the reason why it would say eligible or ineligible. Eligible, that means that the data entered is fine. They didn't see no error message. If it's ineligible, there's a field or something that was missed. It's not calculating correctly. So if it's ineligible, you got to go back to your file and then um, correct that file and then re-upload that new data because you want it to show under eligible. Once you do that, then on that screen itself, it will tell you, um, on that screen itself, it will upload. So at the bottom of that eligible and eligible screen, there is an upload button. So you will upload it. Once it's uploaded, if you go back to the search screen, it's going to show on the search screen. All the data then at that point is going to be entered. However, as I stated earlier, the only issue with that is you still have to go. So this is all the steps for uploading. So I'll make sure that they have this. You will have it step by step. So this is the little CSV file. So just picture this as your, you know, in this Excel file that goes straight across. Remember, the screens I'm showing you is in a tabular form. Okay, so all the data fields that are required have to be completed. So you're filling it in. Okay, so all your calculations, your amounts, you're going to enter everything on that spreadsheet. Then again, I talked about uploading it once you saved it. Okay, so here I'm going to my file upload, finding my files. Once you do upload, it will tell you what file the file has been uploaded here. Okay, so here's showing I'm getting my file to upload. And it's still showing me my upload file here. Let me just a little bit more. See it a little bit more. There we go. Okay. So I'm still working on my file to upload. It's going to tell me my file has been successfully uploaded. And again, I can see my file here. And then it says eligible. Okay. So it's eligible. You can see the report status here and at the bottom is going to say prepare so you're going to select prepare and then it will tell you if something is wrong so it's either going to get a warning message or a validation the red validation means you have to take care of that first or you won't be able to submit it. The yellow is just the warning where you can um, override that message. Okay, once you do that, prepare, it says success. Your reports have been successfully prepared. Okay, if it's an error, it will tell you there is an error message. And you got to go rectify that issue. Okay. And you will see, you can go in, we'll show details of why there is an error. 
And you can see here, and they'll tell you, well, 10A or is it 10? Or whatever line it is, it'll let you know. And then you need to um, select, um, update that error, you know, okay? So once you do that, then, well, actually this is your full upload process. It's kind of short, but the main thing is this is to ensure that your FFR, the, the um, Excel file, has all the required data in it. So ensuring that, ensuring that you enter all the required information on your access, on your Excel file, okay? So I will make sure that uh, Christopher gets this upload um, instructions as long as well as your PowerPoint so you can have it, okay? And if you have any questions along the way regarding the upload process, please don't hesitate to contact us and we will uh, assist you with that process. Corey, I hope that helped. Awesome, thank you. Christopher, I hope that helped, I'm sorry. Thank you, that was helpful. Uh... Okay, uh, we got a few more questions regarding ID.me that just came in. Um, the first one, uh, this is an individual saying they, they have an ID.me account that they use for, for personal reasons, such as with IRS or social security access, um, and a person can only ever have one ID.me account. Uh, so does, if somebody is using ID.me for personal reasons, does that mean they cannot use PMS or, or do they just have to associate uh, a different uh, email address. Correct. Use. You just have to associate your ID. Me just needs to make sure you add. I believe is you add your email address from PMS on that because you only have one ID. Me account, so you just got to associate that email um, that you use for PMS on your ID. Me account, and if you run into errors, contact the ID. Me help desk. It just to be clear, you can have multiple emails associated with a single ID dummy account. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. For think instructions we that we have been provided. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I think. I think I saw one that came in. Um, just to answer your question, there is a group. Um, on your um. On the screen, um, let me go back to PM, let me go back to my PowerPoint. Um, I saw one to come in about multiple multiple um, downloads. So on your screen here, let me just um, so I can make sure you all can see just the current slide. Okay, on your screen when you're doing your search screen, so. However many uh, grants you have on your search screen, if you click here or click next to it and select them, then you hit group actions. That's how you can do multiple at one time. Okay. I thought I saw somebody say ask about multiple uploads. Okay. But you got to select them and then go to group actions and download them to get all of them. Okay. Okay. Great. I think we have addressed all the questions. I just saw one come in. I'll address in a second. Um, I think we addressed all the ones that pertain to this training. Uh, Heather Kleiner, I see your question about requesting in advance of funds. That's a payment request. Uh, payment request question, right? So, so NASA pays all of, all of our grantees on an advanced basis, right? So you just go into the payment management system, make a payment request for your for any immediate expenditures that you need. And if you have any further questions about payments, uh, contact your grant officer that's listed on your, your NASA award. Okay, I think that is it. Corey, do you know if we've missed anything or if there's any outstanding questions? I don't think so. Um, no, there was some discussion in the chat about uh, the use of um, this this bulk upload for if it was solely for awards with indirect cost rate being reported. 
And I just clarified in there that this is in fact for a shortcut if you have multiple awards and it's for all fields. Uh, so, you know, if you have a hundred plus awards, the bulk upload feature will help you cut down some of the administrative process of, ind of individually uploading those into each field. And that, uh, and that should help cut down some of that reporting time. But as Tanja mentioned, they still would have to be individually certified. Yeah, yeah. yeah and we get we, uh, another question about uh, can preparers certify the report? Uh, Tanja, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the answer is yes, and that depends. It also depends on the entity's uh, internal controls, right? Whether or not the entity allows that within their organization. That's correct. Yes, yes. All right. I think that is it. Um, let's see contact information. So our contact information is on the grants policy and compliance uh, website that and I dropped the link into the, the chat earlier. Um, we'll include it again with the, the information that we, we send out. But if you have any other questions uh, for NASA grants policy, you can contact us at the, the information that we'll, we'll provide. Uh, thank you all again very much for, for joining. We appreciate it. Uh, like we said at the top, uh, this has been re recorded. We'll put it onto the NASA grants YouTube playlist. Uh, on that playlist right now, you can go back and find the the previous PMS FFR training, which is pretty much the same as the one we did today on that playlist right now. Um, so that in this one will be up uh, in, in a few days. We'll put it up and then we'll, we'll also send out the slides and the uh, the PDF that Tanja just went over to you all. Uh, thank you again. Let us know if you have anything. Tanja, thank you very much. This has been uh, very helpful and we appreciate your time. You're very welcome. All right. Everybody take care. Have a good day.